Impact of Demographic Trends on Library Services, remarks by Jorge Chement and Kathleen DeLong at the 2012 ARL Fall Forum, convened by Joan Giesecke. Well, let me add my welcome uh, to the first program of the Fall Forum, uh, which, as you know, is uh, entitled The Impact of Demographic Trends on Library Services. I'm Joan Giesecke, Special Assistant to the Chancellor, Dean Emeritus, and Professor at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And I am pleased to introduce our speakers and to moderate this session. As you note from the program, our speakers are going to explore both U.S. and Canadian demographics as a way to sketch a bit of our future for libraries. Uh, they will be touching on the kind of people that work in our libraries as well as looking at what, will, what kind of changes we'll be seeing in our library users. And understanding those impacts and of those trends are going to be important to us as we make decisions about the future of our own libraries. Um, our speakers' biographies are included in your uh, packet, but let me just um, make a few introductory remarks. Jorge Chement is with us, uh, Dean of the School of Communications and Information at Rutgers University. He is a professor in the Bolston uh, School of Public Policy uh, and in the Department of Latino, Hispanic, Caribbean Studies, and he has authored numerous articles and books on these um, trends and uh, communication studies. Kathleen DeLong joins us as the Associate University Librarian at the University of Alberta Libraries. She's been a frequent guest lecturer in the Master's in Library Science program at the University of Alberta and uh, is one of the people who teaches in the leadership and management courses uh, and is a recent, um, has just recently finished her uh, PhD from Simmons. So we are very pleased to have both of our speakers with us today. Jorge plans to highlight the demographic data and changes he has seen over time, what populations are using our libraries, what does this mean for our workforce. Um, Kathleen will be talking about the research that has been done on the Canadian workforce uh, and what's been learned uh, since an initial study in 2003. And she will also uh, share some data on the current workforce trends in Canada. I will do a very brief summary at the end, and then we will have uh, plenty of time for audience questions. So let me turn it over to Jorge Chimet. This year marks the 36th year, I think, that I've been an academic. And whenever I'm introduced, the same thing happens. I get nervous, and then I start sweating. <laughs> so, and about 22 years ago, an older colleague who I respected a lot, still do, um, said, that'll go away after about a year or two. <laughs> So, I'd, thank you for inviting me, first of all. Um, I'd like to spend a, a short time um, discussing three trends that are, have been converging. Um, I think you're aware of all of them. Uh, they've been converging now for some time. Um, in some cases, as long as I've been an academic, they've been uh, converging and converging with consequences that are now becoming so clear that even people on talk shows are, are mentioning them. Uh, but I'd like to discuss the impact they have on, on us, on schools like mine, and on the university as well. Uh, so the first is an economic trend, the tendency, that I um, synopsize by saying basically the states are just getting out of the business of higher education. And they're doing it exactly the way any business would do when they get out of the business. They cut back spending and they sell off assets. And that's exactly what's been happening. What's interesting about the tendency is that it's first noticeable in the data around 1985. So it's been going on for a very, very long time. Now it's only become really visible to my colleagues, myself as well, um, in the last five or ten years. And the reason is that we framed the phenomenon differently for the first 20 years. We saw the phenomenon and every year we said, okay, it's going down, but if we do this or if we do that and if we work Trenton, Austin, Sacramento, um, whatever it was that we had to work, uh, it'll come back. And so we'll just pull our belts a little tighter and in a couple of years or so it'll come back and we'll be 
you know, we'll be able to expand and do whatever we need to do. And of course, it just didn't happen. Um, so I want to show you a little bit about why it didn't happen. First of all, um, what you see on the left um, is an example from New Jersey. And while the states vary considerably, the, all of the arrows point in the same direction. It wasn't a case that the state budgets went down. The state budgets in most states actually went up at the same time that they were cutting their uh, support of, um, of, of higher education. Secondly, what you see uh, is you see that in states that have lots of different tiered universities, the flagships, that is the research universities, did not necessarily get the lion's share of the, of the money. Uh, that even as the money was being cut back, they were being cut back uh, even even more. Now that was a very hard thing to say 10, 15 years ago. It's very difficult to stand up among colleagues from um, universities, in my case like Montclair State or the, the College of New Jersey, and say, you guys are getting more money than we're getting, really. Um, and we ought to be getting more money than you're getting, right? So, so that argument, of course, wasn't going to go uh, wasn't going anywhere. And in some states, including New Jersey, um, the state budget also covered a number of private universities, right? It wasn't all that long ago that Princeton was getting money from the legislature as well as all, all that they have. In fact, um, this November, we will be, the, we the citizens of New Jersey will be voting on a bond uh, issue for building in universities. And when the bond issue was first announced, Princeton, with its $2 billion plus endowment, was on the bond issue to get about about $125 million for, for presumably scarce buildings on their campus. Now, I don't want to knock Princeton per se. Um, we get very good students from them, and we uh, send them very good students. Uh, but the point is that the states weren't even clear for most of that time where to put their priorities. Their priorities were all over the place, and the presumably rational notion that the research universities is where the greatest value comes back to the state, therefore that's where you put your investment, wasn't necessarily on, um, on the table. Another thing that was happening is that um, tuitions were going up. So we have there, right? Um, that, uh, you can see I've, I've really been at it for 36 years, I can't even read the slides. <laughs> So, so this is a, a percent chart, but tuitions have been going up during that period. Now, what's, what's crucial to understand when we see tuitions go up is two things. They go up most rapidly during recessions. And the argument has been all along, you know, those universities, if they'd run their universities better, they wouldn't have to charge as much tuition. And they are responding to inflation in irresponsible ways. They're just jacking, jacking up. Uh, their tuition. Um, and at times when everybody is hurting, that's when they jack it up the most, and that doesn't make any sense. Um, so I'm going to show you why it makes sense. And that is that as state support goes down, tuition goes up. Right? And it's that way across every state in the United States. It's not about inflation. It's not about irresponsibility during recessions. It's not about universities trying to do all kinds of new stuff and then putting it on the backs of students, it's basically, in the case of state universities, of the state getting out of the business, and getting out of the business in a very interesting way. Typically, in public discourse, when money is cut from some program, those who are connected with the program tend to speak up, and the beneficiaries from the program uh, tend, uh, tend to speak up. I'm a veteran, and on many occasions, I have made it clear that I don't like cuts to veterans, even if I'm not necessarily um, a recipient of it. You know, sort of the way we do things in public discourse, with one exception, this one here. Uh, for 25 years, this pattern has been in place, um, longer than 25 years, actually. The pattern has, has been in place, but roughly that long, and nobody spoke up. Um, and the fact that nobody spoke up can be interpreted a number of ways. One way of interpreting is to say, okay, nobody spoke up. We academics are so cowardly anyway that we didn't have the courage to speak up and, uh, when we saw what was happening. But as I said earlier, we saw what was happening but interpreted it differently. We gave it an interpretation that put some, a positive spin on it, framed it differently from the way we could have uh, framed it. But what about the constituents? Did they speak up? Yes, they spoke up. And who did they point the finger at? 
They pointed the finger at us for raising tuition, right? So they spoke up against us. And when they spoke up against us, who did they not speak up against? And that was their legislatures. So the legislatures did not experience criticism. When legislatures experience criticism, they oftentimes respond. If somehow the story had been framed differently, um, if the recipients of the val the direct value of an education had perceived it differently and spoken up differently, it's possible that this conversation would be a very, very different conversation, except for one thing. And I would suggest that um, Americans just don't do well with long trends. This is a, this is a, a long curve, and uh, we just don't, we don't notice long curves because we don't value history, and if you don't value history, you can't plan for the future. So we don't, we, we don't grab on to long curves. We grab on really well to short ones, right? And we oftentimes interpret them as a huge crisis. Uh, it's always seemed to me that every American who ever lived, lived during America's most dangerous moment, at least from, from their perspective. Um, so if you live in that kind of culture, the long curves just aren't, aren't very visible. So I would argue it's probably, probably not realistic to imagine that we would have stood up sometime in the first 10 years and said, hey, what you're doing is going to have really serious consequences. There's one more added um, component of this trend, and that is at the time when a number of state universities have fallen below 10% in, the, uh, in the, the state support that they're getting, and, and a whole bunch of them fall below 20 percent, my, my own included, um, we see a, an increase in every state except for a couple of kids wanting to go to school. And I say kids, it's not just kids anymore, right? It's adults, it's returning veterans, it's people who got, who got credits 10, 15 years ago and now want to get more credits. It's all kinds of people who are now creating a demand for higher education, and that demand is coming as tuition rates are the highest in real dollars that they've ever been, and in being the highest in real dollars uh, that they've ever been, they are um, also encountering um, huge demand. That demand we should see as positive, but it's not playing out in a positive way. It's playing out negatively in, in two ways. State universities are not expanding the number of, let's call them, desks that they offer. Uh, in ways to, to meet the demand. And secondly, the increased demand is fomenting a criticism, and that criticism is aimed at who? It's aimed at us, right? We're not providing enough educational opportunities for um, the students of our state. Why should we get more support? We're not even doing a good job. Uh, right now is the frame that, uh, that is currently there. So in the first tendency, I would argue, there were a number of narratives that uh, were developed over time. All of those narratives saw us as the villain in the narrative rather than seeing us as the solution in the narrative. And the key actor in the narrative was never even in the narrative, was sort of left, left out of the narrative. And therefore, the opportunity for a public discourse that was a little more rational um, uh, just did not come around. Um, so trend number one. Or tendency number one. Tendency number two. Um, our 21st hour, um, in Mexico I'd say the North Americans, but of course I can't say that in English. So U.S. Um, population is going to alter traditional notions, not only of who is an American, but it's going to alter the self-image of what we do and who we offer it to. Uh, I arrived for the second time, my second hitch, so to speak, at, at uh, Rutgers in 2008, which was the year that the percentage of white undergraduate students fell below 50% for the first time. Um, and it stayed there. Uh, it's going to stay there till after I retire easily. Um, but it was also the year that the percentage of women went above the percentage of men uh, for the first time. And at Rutgers, it's a long curve, right? We're going to be 250 years old in a, in a few years. Um, so it's the very first time that those two happen. Nobody that I talk to, and none of the data I see, says that's going to change um, any anytime soon. Is it having an effect? Yes, it's having a big effect on who we are. It's having an effect on how we teach because they process information differently sometimes. They come from a different set of assumptions and premises when we encounter them in the classroom. A whole bunch of things change that are not necessarily quantifiable, but that affect the quality of delivery of, uh, of higher education. 
So this is a very quick picture of New Jersey, and the reason I put it up is that it is a window into what the United States is going to look like um, in the uh, next uh, 10, 15 years. Um, so we have the third largest Indian and Korean populations, fourth largest Chinese and Filipino populations. Uh, after New York, we have as percentage of population, we have the largest Jewish population. We also have the largest Muslim population, right? Um, and that doesn't appear to be an issue either in our schools um, nor in our communities. Um, we also have uh, what is now the largest uh, of the, the two ethnic minorities that we identify in the U.S. as big ones. Latinos now constitute 16 percent of New Jersey's population. African Americans, I think, constitute 15 percent. So let's say they're the same. Um, the largest population of Peruvians and Costa Ricans in the entire United States, more Cubans than outside of Florida, and of labor force growth in the next um, 10, 15 years, this says five years, but even longer than that, they're going to constitute 66% per of the growth, which tells you something about both immigration to the state and birth rates, right? And which of all the groups I've got up here, which group has the highest dropout rate from high school? That group, right? So the challenge for the state is you're growing the most, the fastest among a group of people who also take their kids out of school before they graduate, which takes them out of the pipeline for a university education. And what could easily happen to New Jersey, already happened in California, which has the same issue, is that over time as that happens, those people become voters and taxpayers, and they don't want to support higher education because they're not getting it. They're not entering it. Why should they have to have to pay for it, and it becomes a really difficult situation to come in contending with, uh, with one's own population. Nationally, the trend data is fairly clear, although it evokes a number of very interesting, um, contradictory, if you will, uh, theories. One is that by the time that this happens in 2050, although some of us think it's probably going to happen a bit sooner than that, maybe as early as 2040, in the 2040 census, that that's largely going to be unnoticeable because America has such a powerful assimilationist culture that it's going to draw those people in in the way that it has drawn people in before. And these just aren't going to be issues that we, that we have to deal with. The other theory says, yeah, if you look at the literature, people said that in 1890. They said that in the 1830s. And in each case, what happened was that these groups entered American society. They became a mainstream, but American society was transformed by them as well. So it isn't as if one absorbs the other without exhibiting some kind of, of transformation. My, my favorite story these days is uh, Nancy and I were recently uh, with a nephew and, and our son and some other kids camping in the Adirondacks. And we went into a grocery store these tiny little, if you've ever been up there, you know, there's these little tiny towns, little tiny grocery stores. We walk into the grocery store, and while they're shopping, I'm wandering around. And across the entire back row are a whole row, the entire store of piñatas, all on the top row. So I thought, well, this is pretty neat. So I came down, and I said, gosh, you must have a big Mexican population here somewhere, thinking in my mind, where is the next taco stand that we can go to? And she looked at me like I was from Pluto and said, there's no Mexicans who live here. I said, well, what about all those piñatas back there? Because everybody uses them for their birthday parties. So society absorbs and changes at the same time, right? And this is a real tiny little example, but it happens in a lot of other ways. So that means we have to change as universities and have to change in a way that we're aware of how we're responding and how we, uh, we ourselves are changing. That change is not going to be uniform. These are uh, metropolitan areas that also have a number of universities in them. They're all university towns. And in every case, they're not one university town. They're multiple university towns. And every one of them is going to look somewhat different from the other in terms of who the demographics of its population are. And as that happens, those universities are going to have a choice. They can either engage or not engage. If they don't engage, they may be following a, a kind of interpretation that says, we're a national university, we serve the whole, the whole country, we don't really have to be concerned with exactly what's happening in our town. That's not a new theory, right? Or they can choose to engage. If they engage, they will be engaging somewhat differently um, across the United States. So one prediction would be, if our universities adapt, they're going to become more dissimilar from each other in significant ways, and that has direct implications for their libraries. 
um, as, as we go forward. Okay, so that's trend number two. Demographic changes are underway. They have consequences, some of which are easy to see, but some of which are not, not so apparent. They all have implications, not only for our universities, but for our university libraries. So the states are indeed rethinking their relationship. I shouldn't have rethinking in there, because I don't think much thinking has gone into this at all, <laughs> actually. They're, they're activating, but they're not necessarily thinking very hard about it. But the combination of withdrawal from higher education and equivocacy toward public libraries, um, which I'm going to show you in a minute, uh, is going to challenge how we think the ideals of public education are. So I've got this up here to make the point that it's not only universities that are experiencing state support or public support withdrawal. Right? What we have across the United States is either stagnation in funding or decline in funding in, um, in some way. Um, um, somebody's here from Nebraska, right? We've got somebody from Nebraska. Okay, all right, so they're increasing their libraries. But nobody else is doing anything like that, right? All the others are, are cutting back. And it used to be that the concentration per 100,000, libraries per 100,000 in the U.S., um, was early on most evident in cities. Throughout the 20th century, that changed so that it was most evident in rural areas. And what we're seeing now is a withdrawal uh, in, in rural areas as well. That has, that's about the profession. So let's think a little bit about these first two tendencies and the third and how it affects the profession. Okay, so um, against that population in New Jersey, which will soon be major minority majority population, those who are there, in effect, intellectual servants, um, don't look like them. Right? We talk a lot about diversity. We talk a lot about the value of diversity. We talk about it on my faculty. We talk about it at, I know Marianne um, is very keen on pushing as much many diversity policies as possible in the library. But in the end, what we have to look at is who are we and where are we and what can we do to create a future um, force of librarians that doesn't look like this. I think that is a very, very difficult and emotional challenge to take up. It's one thing to say, okay, you know, I'm in my mid-60s. It's time for you to step aside. You know, you're bald, you're old, you're fat. You know, get out of the way. Let some, you know, young, hungry, athletic kid step in and do the job for you. That he'll probably do better, right? That's one thing to say that, and I can't deny anything, you know, any of those, right? If... if if I look in the mirror and I don't see it, my daughter is certain to remind me of it whenever she comes over. So I can't deny that kind of stuff. It's much harder to say, let's find somebody who's not like me. Let's find somebody who doesn't think like me. Let's find somebody who has a whole different cultural experience and have them step in and run my institution uh, and have me step out of the way. I think that is very, very tough. I see it on my faculty as much as they try. It's a very tough thing to do. I've seen it on other faculties. Uh, it's just very difficult, but I'd say there is. You know, we have to we have to confront the past and the future at the same time. Now, these next two slides are about change. Since uh, what I'm doing is I'm condensing a whole lot of data, and when you condense a whole lot of data, that sort of gets a little funny sometimes um, because I've only I'm only doing four slides, I think here um, in in this. Nonetheless, what you see is a the only group that's had any kind of increase uh, in percentages. Now, I go back here, and you can see increase in percentages doesn't necessarily start with a big base. Uh, increase in percentages have been Latino librarians. Um, I, I'm not sure why. You know, as a Latino who's an academic, I'm not, not quite sure uh, why that is, but I do see the data, uh, and I find it intriguing, especially when you look at the others um, and, and see what's happening to the others. Uh, total numbers are probably not up. Um, as most university libraries and public libraries have tended to do the same thing. There was a time when the director of HR had an MLS. The director of HR in a lot of places doesn't have an MLS now. The kind of professionalization has taken place that has shrunk the percentage of professional credentialed uh, librarians. That's changed the workforce. Maybe that's had something to do with this. I don't really know. 
that's the direction the age group is going. So it's not only 90% of the, the workforce is, is white, it's also a rapidly aging workforce. So how many of you here consider yourselves rapidly aging? <laughs> Absolutely. And you know you're, when you're a male, you know you're rapidly aging when the hair starts not growing here, but growing out of the top of your nose, right, or from your ears, or someplace like that, you know, which makes you a really old man, uh, as my, my daughter calls me. Um, so nonetheless, um, there's the change. There's the demand of the change. There was a time when we would be here and let out all of these um, concerns that one day there just weren't going to be any librarians, right? That doesn't appear to be, to be the case. Uh, most of us are deadly afraid of retiring anyway. Uh, it doesn't appear to be the case, but that transition is going to take place. And when that transition is going to take place, somebody is going to step in, and the question is, are we managing the pipeline of, uh, of who's, going to who's going to step in? Um, I run a uh, library school, and I would love to stand here and tell you that my library school has been able to recruit all kinds of diverse students, and I can tell you they have, and they've tried, but our percentages probably aren't any different from what you see there. The percentages going to library school are smaller than the percentages uh, in, the, in the population, or in the university population even. Uh, we're not attracting even our share, if you will, um, of, the, of the crowd. So without, and I'm going to talk about bringing, bringing people into the profession here for a second and suggest some strategies which have been circulating for some time. Um, without aggressive recruitment among diverse students, uh, we don't get them. And aggressive recruitment doesn't just mean grabbing somebody by the lapels and say, go to, go to library school, damn it. It means thinking about what it is that motivates them differently. One of the characteristics that makes it very difficult to recruit Latino students to go away to college is they come from communal large families, and those clans stay together by keeping people together. And so when a Latino student drops out of high school, we see them as a failure, they see them as a hero because they're helping the economy of the, of the clan. So unless we engage that and come to terms with it and work it in somehow, we're not going to have particular success if we bump up against that. And that's just one example. There's all kinds of examples with different ethnic groups of how to, um, how to bring them in that we probably haven't thought about um, a whole lot. So I'm going to say first tap the pipeline. I think the key really is in the pipeline. We have to expand the potential pool if we're going to change the profile of who's going to be around this table 10, 15 years from now, uh, and if we're going to increase the numbers uh, coming in. And I'm going to suggest that that pipeline starts with what got you into the profession. And what got you into the profession in something like 90% of all the interviews that we've conducted is you experience working in a library, being part of a library, at some point when you were young either in high school or in college or something like that, and you made friends with some of the librarians, you found out how fascinating it was, you really liked it, and you decided to pursue it. That's going to work with those other kids as well. They have to be brought in through the same pipeline that created you, and the pipeline that created you didn't start the day you went into an MLS program. It started much earlier than that, and it started in a very emotional, affective way. So recruiting students into internships and libraries, bringing them into the research library, making them part of the whole process, uh, turns out to be very important. We can do this with faculty, too. Reaching into the pipeline also works with faculty, but that's my problem. Um, those experiences um, make, a, make a big difference. And it isn't just bringing them in. You have to engage them. You know, the kid who's just putting books into shelves isn't necessarily discovering the magic of the library. Somebody has to engage them and bring them in and talk to them and let them see other aspects of it as well. It's not just a matter of, of cheap labor. Um, we can engage undergraduates especially. So I think for research libraries, it begins with undergraduates who come into the research library and see that it's not at all what perhaps they, they thought about. We also have to confront graduate school. And that turns out to be pretty tough. ALA has a Spectrum Scholars program, which works magnificently for a very small number of people. 
uh, we've got to figure out a way to increase the volume and to do so in a number of ways that brings those folks into graduate school in a successful way. The hardest thing to overcome is a cohort of students who weren't successful and then tell others that the, the place stunk. Right? That's very hard to overcome. It takes decades to overcome that, that kind of reputation. Our research libraries have to change. Those spaces that increasingly are crowded with students. I walk into Alexander Library and I am amazed that I haven't heard anybody yet because I step over people when I'm, when I'm walking around. Not only that, but avoid putting my foot into pizza containers and all kinds of stuff. There are just a lot of kids in that library. We have to go from study hall to collaborative space. That library also has to become the place where students come and do work and collaborate, have the technology, have access to all kinds of information that enhances what they're experiencing as, as undergraduates. Number two, we have to, in, in the era of big data, which is the era that we've entered, I would suggest that research libraries should become the places where that huge amount of data that's being put together is not only housed and distributed and managed, but is also taught. That we can add value to the university by saying, you know, okay, we know you got big data here and big data there and big data there. If we bring it together, not only can we gather economies, we can create more creative opportunities for people to think about this, and we'll teach even more people how to take advantage of it. Um, we can do that. We've done it before. Uh, we can certainly, uh, certainly do that again. And then third, the humanities of the 21st century are only going to be as good as the unique collections you find and you, you put together. We, university libraries have been putting together unique collections for a long time, but the value of a university library in the future, I'm going to suggest, is no longer going to be ranked by the number of volumes. It's going to be ranked in different ways. It's going to be, and one of the things it's going to be ranked in is by the unique and valuable character of the collections that it, uh, that it brings together. And what, what are they? I don't know. Um, but I know that the humanities depend on that. Finally, three realities. I want to uh, quote from Phyllis Dane, who some of you may remember, at Columbia. Um, she said at an Elise meeting in 1990, the university is no longer a quiet place to teach and do scholarly work at a measured pace and contemplate the universe. That's the university, actually, I thought I was joining when I became an academic in 1976. It is big, complex, demanding, competitive, bureaucratic, and chronically short of money. And within about a year, I figured out that's the kind of university I had actually joined. Jane Jacobs said, city areas with flourishing diversity sprout strange and unpredictable uses and peculiar scenes, but this is not a drawback of diversity. This is the point. I'm going to suggest that, regardless of what happens at the Supreme Court, uh, diversity is important because that's just the way we are. Um, and it, it is our fundamental human asset, um, and we ought to be doing something with it. And then finally, Alfred North Whitehead, what he said in 1938, is true 80 years later. Uh, and that is that our task as a university is indeed to create the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to start with a story about how my professional career and research interests were shaped by demographics. In 1996, I was fortunate to attend an ARL Institute on Human Resources. Stanley Wilder was a keynote speaker, and he presented to us the results of his research into the aging patterns of our profession. His most memorable quote, in demographic terms, librarianship in North America is a profession apart. Librarians are, as a group, substantially older than those in comparable professions, and they are aging at a much faster rate. <laughs> he went on to, to note that at, time, or that at that time, 63% of librarians were over 45 years of age versus 39% in comparable professions, and all of this was very interesting. However, Wilder had also analyzed the Canadian ARL data separately from the American. And he went on to stress that the Canadian ARL population was conspicuously old. <laughs> 
even by ARL standards. <laughs> And so it became a little joke at the HR Institute for American colleagues to walk up to me and say something like, gosh, Kathleen, you don't look any older than the average ARL librarian. <laughs> As I wasn't at that time anywhere near the age range that Wilder was talking about, it was great fun for them and not so much for me. Uh, but it made me think. I went home to the University of Alberta, started looking at our demographics locally and talking to my colleagues about what this meant for us and also for the Canadian library workforce. And we decided we needed to examine this workforce at a more granular level and collect data to act as a benchmark for the future. This became the ADARS research study. Of course, future thinking is what this forum is all about. What should our organizations be like in the 21st century? What are we preparing for? As this fall forum acknowledges, staffing is the most important factor. Therefore, I would argue that it is vital to keep apprised of labor market information as well as more local demographic factors. As we well know, we don't have the luxury of creating new organizations or deciding who's recruited into the profession. As, as Jorge was just saying, the key is in the pipeline. Or completely hiring um, afresh. So the seeds of our future staffing are already germinating, and I believe that the ways in which we pay attention to the emergent workforce, as well as our current staffing complement, its composition, its skills and development, are key to the 21st century library workforce. Uh, I'm going to do two things uh, this afternoon to follow up on Jorge's talk. First, I'm going to talk about our ADARS research that I was involved in, which was a look at supply and demand within the Canadian library workforce, uh, labor market information essentially, that included demographics. Uh, this was the work that was inspired by the Wilder story I related a few moments ago. And then I'm going to talk about how we use demographic information and knowledge of our own staffing needs at the University of Alberta to develop a new vision for service and to change our public service and staffing model. I would like to acknowledge at the outset that the work I'm talking about I was deeply involved in, but also included the thinking and participation of many others, and including uh, the chairmanship of Ernie Ingalls, uh, who is in the audience uh, today. In that vein, when we were in the middle of our study, about 2004, we talked to Dr. Jose Marie Griffiths and Don King, who were embarking upon the IMLS-funded study, The Future of Librarians in the Workforce. I've never seen their data or final report, but if any of you have any information about it, I would be really uh, glad to hear it, because it would be interesting to do some comparisons between Canadian and American data and see if we have a common structure to our respective workforces. I suspect that we do, uh, especially with uh, regards to large research libraries, and it would be interesting to see the commonalities as well as the differences and the reasons for them. So this was our starting question. Um, what demographics and labor market trends do we need to explore so that we can better understand our workforce needs and staffing composition and also develop strategies for planning and decision making? We were, we were thinking pretty big. Um, by 2003, there was a lot of crisis talk and hype in the literature about workforce shortages in libraries in Canada as well as in the U.S. For example, an article that appeared in 2000 in the Canadian Quill Inquirer indicated that 48% of librarians could retire by the year 2005. So this engendered a lot of crisis talk. But the ADARS team uh, didn't just want to study projected retirements. We wanted to reframe the discussion. And so instead, our focus became labor market trends and the whole of the Canadian library workforce. Um, in the process, we learned that there wasn't a a clear succession crisis, but there were some issues of urgency. Uh, recruitment rather than retirement, as I've said, needed to become the focus. The conversation needed to change from questions about numbers of retirements to defining the positions, the skills and abilities we need in our organizations, and the strategies for moving into recruitment as soon as we have the opportunity to do so. Competencies, particularly management and leadership competencies, uh, were defined as key within library organizations. Workloads and job stress needed to be monitored. Given the budget problems and resulting loss of positions through most of the 1990s, it wasn't unusual that library staff would feel the results of a retrenchment. 
Role overlap between librarians and paraprofessionals was increasing, and this continued to need some thoughtful oversight. And finally, the diversity of our Canadian library workforce was also an issue that needed some attention. Through discussion with many colleagues from different library sectors, um, this then became our objective, this comprehensive investigation of issues around the eight R's. Now, recruitment, retention, retirement, I'm sure you would all have a sense of what those were about, as well as remuner remuneration. Um, it was Ernie Ingalls who coined the term repatriation. This was the question of whether or not we could uh, repatriate um, those library school graduates that we had lost um, from Canada um, during many of during the 1990s. Many of our graduates went to the states and other places. Uh, Reaccreditation: Did we need some formal way of recrediting professionals at points in their career? Uh, rejuvenation: What were um, what was happening in terms of professional development, and finally restructuring. So, you know, when positions became vacant in libraries, were those positions um, filled as they had been in the past? Probably not. There was probably a lot of, of restructuring that was going on, and we wanted to probe that as well. And the project scope, it was a three-year study that we undertook. Um, we ended up with um, a number of, of data tables. I'm going to summarize some of that data for you this afternoon. Um, over 900 variables and a report that we published um, that you'll see the URL for a little bit later. Um, and a number of analyses of our data by library sector and by subsector. Because remember, this was the whole of the Canadian library workforce, so it also included um, other library sectors such as public libraries and special libraries. Uh, we used a variety of methods, including analyses of existing data, Stats Canada, Statistics Canada, and library school graduate data, telephone interviews with uh, senior library administrators, focus groups with representatives from the Canadian Association of Research Libraries and the Canadian Urban Libraries Council. Uh, these are the largest employers of library workers in Canada, with the exception of the federal government. Uh, we had print surveys for library institutions and web-based surveys uh, that professional librarians and paraprofessional, that were directed to professional librarians and paraprofessional library staff. Both of our surveys uh, employed multi-stage random sampling strategies to ensure representation from all library sectors and geographic areas. Sample sizes and response rates for both surveys were sufficient to allow confidence in our findings. Let me turn now to some of the things we learned about the Canadian library workforce. First of all, workforce demographics and perceptions um, of work. We collected information about age, gender, number of staff in supervisory or management roles, which turned out to be 62% of librarians. Union density, 67% of librarians and 79% of paraprofessional staff are represented by unions in Canada. Longevity in career and employment status, along with other, many other characteristics. <laughs> um, it's no surprise to us, of course, that we are a female-dominated profession, with 80% of librarians and 90% of our paraprofessional staff um, being female. Um, in Canada, our visible minorities and Aboriginal peoples make up very small percentages of our population of library workers. Canada's employment equity legislation defines four designated groups in employment. Women, visible, visible minorities, persons with disabilities, and Aboriginal peoples. Recruitment of women into the library workforce is obviously not a problem, but we found that the other groups, specifically visible minorities and Aboriginal peoples, were underrepresented across all types of libraries, and persons with disabilities were almost non-existent in the library workforce. Additionally, we found that few libraries recognize the credentials of immigrant librarians. Looking um, at age of library staff a little bit more closely. At the time of our study, uh, about 25% of all librarians and 20% of all paraprofessionals were aged 55 or older, compared to 11% of the Canadian workforce as a whole. So we are indeed um, an older workforce. 
Um, and just as Wilder found, uh, librarians are older than comparable professions, um, examined as a whole. Our entire library workforce is much older than the Canadian uh, labor uh, force. So it's evident that we are in competition with other sectors for a supply of workers, and we can also see that it's likely that all types of libraries are in competition for workers at the same time. Uh, the study also looked at a number of variables associated with job satisfaction and workload manageability and other stress factors. Overall, job satisfaction for both librarians and paraprofessionals is fairly high. This can and should be used as a promotional element to help attract individuals to the profession and to the library workforce. Um, these satisfaction levels also hold by career stage. As I mentioned, we analyzed our data um, according to a number of elements. Most of the data we broke down by uh, recent entrance, mid-career, and then um, senior, senior staff or senior librarians. So with uh, satisfaction level, 78% of recent entrants, 75% uh, of mid-career, and 81% of senior librarians are satisfied or highly satisfied with their jobs. A multivariate regression analysis of the major contributors to job satisfaction revealed that the two single most important factors for both professionals and paraprofessionals are that they are treated with respect by their superiors and that they work in a job that allows them to grow and learn new skills. The respect factor was really significant in, um, in the findings. And in fact, um, at one point I remember we we mused whether or not we should go back and you know, make a ninth R, which was respect, and, and do more probing about that. Um, that it is so important to library staff to be able to develop, to develop professionally is a very positive finding since it fits well with the dynamic trends of a changing library sector. Having seen high satisfaction levels, library administrators and supervisors need to carefully watch both workload and job stress, which appear to be increasing for both librarians and paraprofessionals. Now, these are perceptions, and we did not measure uh, you know, workload over time. But when asked to compare to five years previous, 55% of mid-career and senior librarians agreed that they were having to uh, work harder, and 67% agreed their job was more stressful. And as we will see in a few moments and a few slides on, library administrators stated that an important and difficult to fulfill competency in recruitment is the ability to handle a high level, a high volume workload. So it seemed fairly clear that um, administrators recognized that workloads were very demanding. With respect to recruitment to the profession, we found that positive exposure to libraries and librarians is the best predictor of librarianship as a career choice. And there were no significant differences in the original, original motivations for choosing the professional librarian career between new professionals and senior librarians. So same, same kinds of, of motivations bringing people um, to libraries. Uh, many respondents indicated reasons for choosing the profession that are in alignment with the values of librarianship, such as an appreciation for learning, research, and serving the public good. Turning to recruitment in the various library sectors, we found that Carl libraries in particular were not experiencing any problems in recruitment. But this was in contrast to large urban public libraries who did feel that they were in competition with the Carl libraries and, and other academic libraries. Uh, we looked at three different scenarios um, of retirement distribution for our supply and demand equation. Assuming static retirement ages of 60, 62, and 65, respectively. If librarians retired younger, this would meant, have meant a spike of retirements by 2009 and then uh, 2014. However, if librarians on the whole delayed retirements, the number of retirements would be spread out, of course, over a longer period of time. And this is what um, we believe we see happening now, as we suspect that the average age of retirement is near to 65 or more. And our data had shown um, that most senior librarians or those nearing retirement age uh, really didn't feel strongly either way about their age of retirement and that they would be influenced by personal financial factors as well as organizational uh, policies and practices. 
These predictions of future supply um, are based on um, age of our age of retirement at 62 scenario. It assumes that the library environment remains completely static, so no expansion or decrease in library school seats or in positions um, within library organizations, uh, no loss of graduates to other labor markets, no increased demand for library workers. It's an artificial situation, but it does illustrate that the supply to 2009 of new librarians to replace departures due to retirements was predicted to have the capacity to fill 98% of current librarian positions and the capacity to replace uh, library technicians uh, at 99%. The longer term supply to 2014 of new librarians to replace departures due to retirements is predict predicted to have the capacity to fill 89% of the current librarian positions and the capacity for technician positions is identical. So assuming that um, the scenario of retirement at age 62 was holding, supply and demand should have been uh, pretty much in balance. And um, as we um, see today, um, we uh, find what we might term an oversupply of new librarians. So clearly the age 62 scenario was not, you know, did not hold. That was our best guess at the time. Uh, labor force supply and demand isn't just about numbers, however. There are questions around what competencies, abilities, and experience are lost when senior librarians retire. We asked a series of questions about what administrators thought they would lose when librarians retired. And a list of 23 competencies was given to respondents, asking the competencies that were most important and most difficult to fill. Of the 23 competencies that respondents were asked to review, the highest ranked of the most important and difficult to fill competencies when recruiting were leadership potential, managerial skills, ability to respond flexibly to change, the ability to handle high volume workload and innovation. Overall, libraries said they experienced greater difficulties in replacing leadership qualities lost than technical skills and knowledge. Um, as well, 46% of libraries stated their current pool of internal candidates was inadequate to replace uh, lost leadership qualities, uh, which was a pretty poor reflection of recruitment practice in my books. We had a number um, of questions that probed level of interest in leadership management functions, and we found some interesting inconsistencies. Though the current and predicted future demand are high for librarians to perform managerial functions, and though six out of 10 librarians stated that they were currently working as managers or supervisors, only 44% of librarians indicated that it was important for them to be able to manage a service or department. And even fewer, 36%, provided the same response for supervising others. Uh, luckily, interest in leadership is more apparent. 62% of librarians express an interest in performing a leadership role. It's also interesting to note that in response to the open-ended question about motivation for choosing librarianship, no respondent indicated interest in leadership, managing libraries, or supervising um, others as their reason for joining the profession. Uh, given the demand for leadership and management competencies, it's also interesting to turn to a graph on the type of training provided to um, librarians. Um, it's evident that the numbers of libraries offering training in management and leadership skills doesn't match the demand for these roles. Most training is for technology and job-related skills. We found that traditional librarian duties are being taken on in an increasing capacity by paraprofessional staff. About 78% of institutions reported that paraprofessionals have taken on more of these responsibilities um, over the past five years, and 77% of libraries said that paraprofessionals would have to take on more traditional librarian duties in the future. So role shift between the two groups is, you know, it's happening and it's uh, uh, predicted to, to continue in the future. So in the end, um, we could see uh, a number of challenges arising uh, from this study. 
Um, recruitment to our profession, of course, isn't just solely about numbers. It is about qualities and competencies, that question of who, you know, who, we, who we want to be um, in our libraries. Um, retirements offer um, a great deal of opportunity, um, but can we capitalize upon them? Can we, can we change sufficiently to, to um, um, allow our libraries to encompass all of the things that they, the new things that they need to? And the, uh, we also need to recognize that shifts in workload, um, as well as uh, the potential of staff, um, you know, workload is, um, is, is going to con continue to be a factor. Um, and we need to redesign services and processes in order to better meet the needs of faculty and students. So um, there are also a number of implications arising uh, from the study. Um, at the time that the uh, study was published, we couldn't see any imminent crisis in, in library staff supply and demand. Um, and we hope that we, that we redirected the discussion um, from that of retirement to one of recruitment and need the competencies of all staff. Um, obviously, we want to attract the best and the brightest to the profession and to individual uh, libraries. And again, um, just to repeat um, what Jorge said earlier, um, you know, the key really is in, in that pipeline. Uh, we need to ensure that strong, candidate gets, strong candidates get um, leadership and management development opportunities and that there is understanding that, the, that these are necessary roles within our organization. And we need to focus on competencies and skills development of all staff. Um, and how are we going to predict what those competencies are? I know there's a great deal of work been done on competencies. Certainly we've done um, a lot of work um, at the University of Alberta on our standards and competencies, uh, but the question is, you know, how well are we calling those and are we, um, uh, how, how are we forecasting the future and what we need? Uh, this whole question of shifting roles, um, I think myself that it's probably more so one of segmentation of responsibilities rather than paraprofessionals taking on librarian roles, but um, we need to continue to pay attention to that um, and we need to really think about succession planning holistically, uh, right from the bottom to the top of the organization, um, including you know, the new roles and responsibilities that, are, that we need, and acknowledging that we need to plan for that more diverse workforce, and how do we get that diversity that we, that we need and that our institutions need. Uh, this is um, uh, some of the sources that you can turn to uh, to learn more about the data that we collected and published. Um, as you will see when you look at uh, the reports, most of the forecasts go to 2014. And we are currently looking for funding, and I'm looking at my Carl colleagues as I say this, <laughs> to resurvey key variables and see if our predictions about what might happen have been borne out and also what lies ahead. I would now like to um, turn briefly to talk about how our demographics um, impacted our thinking on library services at the University of Alberta. And I would stress that local demographics are an important evidence base for making staffing and institutional decisions. Again, um, a number of people were part of this effort. Uh, you'll see listed some of the colleagues that joined me in the original um, thinking, but it began with one library and we moved um, the model to all of our libraries. So again, many others were involved in this work. In 2006, we were looking carefully at our staff demographics. On average, um, the, or rather the average age of our staff was hovering around 53, 54, and we could see that we would be facing retirements over the next five to seven years, and um, this would be particularly, not exclusively, but certainly would be impacting our public service areas. We knew this was an opportunity to rethink the composition of our staff complement. Our professional staff were telling us that they were experiencing uh, pressures to do more liaison work as well as more instruction, and many of them were experimenting with embedded services in academic departments. 
They wanted to continue to do reference work, but there were activities that were taking them away from the reference desk for long periods of time. As with all academic libraries, we could also see that the volume of our transactional services, whether it was reference or circulation, was changing. Just to give you an example, in 99-2000, our circulation stats were over a million transactions. By 2006-07, we did slightly over 650,000. In a new service scenario, we could also see a very viable place for self-service technologies. And we also saw from LiveQual comments that our quality of service was uneven. It could vary depending upon the time of day and the service point that was approached. All of these factors led us to begin a discussion of how we could fill positions, how, how we should fill positions as they became vacant, uh, the current service model, and how we might change it to provide better service overall. And we called this situation the perfect storm. Um, just a, a word about us to give you a, a sense of the size of the University of Alberta in case you're not familiar with us. Um, around um, 36,000 um, uh, students overall. Um, and as you can see, we have about um, 82 professionals, around 200 support staff, and a number of casual student workers. Um, 11th in the ARL Investment Index, and eight libraries with two libraries um, on other campuses. So we're a large and fairly decentralized, in terms of our public service, a fairly decentralized system. This became our service vision. Um, that each library would have one service desk, open all hours that the library was open. So when the library was open, service would be available. There wouldn't ever be a situation where you would walk in and, and not find someone available to you. Public services staff, librarians, and paraprofessionals would provide information, technology, and library used customer services. So at that one service desk, um, all questions would be focused. Uh, des the desk would be staffed to meet user demand to ensure a timely response. So we um, looked a lot at our service peaks, our scheduling, and, and really tried to ensure that, um, that students, faculty, whomever came through our doors weren't waiting. When they came to the desk, there was someone there to aid them. And we also redeveloped um, a group of staff that we called our access services staff to ensure that processing and handling of library materials uh, continued during all open hours. So just because you came into the library in the evening, that didn't mean that something couldn't be retrieved for you um, if you if you needed it. So um, this single service desk model involved both paraprofessionals as well as librarians providing an integrated circulation reference um, and technology support service to all users. Implementation um, was critical. We put major effort into recruiting high-level paraprofessional workers and providing the necessary training. Uh, we also developed standards and competencies for all staff working on the desk and procedures for referral and expert consultation. Um, now, libraries, librarians spend approximately half the time on the public services desk that they did previously, but are still contributing training um, and mentoring the other desk staff. They are also available for expert referral and consultation. Uh, these are some of the outcomes that, uh, that we have achieved. Just going to let you look at them for a moment as we wind up here. And one final note, um, if you want to think more about managing demographic risk, I would point you to an excellent article that appeared in the Harvard Business Review that talks about the dual threats of capacity risk and productivity risk, uh, which is mostly um, what our service desk intervention was about and how we can strategically uh, deal with these risks. So uh, that's the end and time for questions. Great. Um, before we head to questions, let me just summarize very briefly a couple of other statistics that might help us as we're thinking about the changes we're seeing and what our 21st century library workforce will look like, uh, given the background that we have um, just heard. Um, I, went, um, I decided to 
take a look at the median ARL library, the one that only exists in our statistics. And in the last 10 years, the median ARL library has gone from 262 to 242 positions. Uh, some of that we take care of with automation, but we are certainly have decreased the size of our workforce. We have also, on the other hand, our institutions have been increasing the size of our student enrollment, and so we are serving more students while we have fewer positions. Diversity, as we have mentioned, uh, has remained rather stable in our libraries. 14.1% uh, uh, in 07-08 uh, were diverse. Uh, members of our library's uh, professional staff, 14.2% in 2010. Years of experience, we know that um, that mass of retirements did not occur. Um, we do have, we've had, we have fewer people, a little bit lower percentage of people with more than 20 years of experience, but we also have fewer people with less than three years of experience. And so our population is centering somewhat. Um, as Jorge pointed out, there is a disconnect between our students and our workforce. Um, we have fewer positions, fewer retirements, fewer new hires potentially, and yet we're dealing with a changing national work for, uh, student population that is going to impact the kinds of services we have to provide. And one of the things that we haven't touched on but will be a part of the discussions for the rest of this uh, forum today and tomorrow is that our undergraduates are changing. And if you've um, read Academically Adrift, uh, limited Learning on College Campuses, which just came out last year. Uh, the study that was done based on the Collegiate Learning Assessment, that's a, a test that's given uh, every two years, so you're dealing with freshmen and uh, end of their sophomore or beginning of their junior year, 45% of the students uh, across the U.S. in higher education showed no improvement in learning for uh, critical skills, including critical thinking, complex reasoning, and writing. And that is a very scary statistic out there. The highly selective schools have taken really bright people. They're still bright people two years later. That's a good thing. Um, but as we expand who is coming into higher ed in some ways, um, we are finding that our education may not be uh, getting the results we want. Students see themselves as consumers. We all know that. Um, and according to the authors, they are, as we know, seeking the, the best uh, benefit they can get for the least amount of effort. I don't think that's really new. Uh, seems like students have been doing that for a very long time. But they're having fewer interactions with faculty outside of their classrooms. They are not as challenged academically on the undergraduate level. They may be writing less than 20 pages a, year, a semester in a course. And so, as we men as Hori mentioned, our faculty are rewarded for uh, their research productivity. In many places, teaching may be undervalued and yet we are trying to um, create our future workforce uh, in higher education. So our challenge uh, that we're facing, that we'll be talking about, is that um, our undergraduates may be coming out without necessarily having the skills that we want them to have, but they also are spending less time on research and academics. Um, we know there's a decrease in traditional library services, as we just mentioned, and one of the scary things is that employers are noting um, in a 2006 survey, only 16% of new graduates excelled at writing and 28% excel in critical thinking. And this is where we're going to draw our workforce. Um, but there are opportunities, and we've already mentioned them. Library spaces are very important on our campuses. We know they're well used. Our 24 by 7 access is very important. We know people are accessing the materials uh, electronically. We know teaching information literacy skills is going to be crucial particularly as we look at those statistics of, of students not learning writing or critical thinking skills. And we know we're moving our staff from a collection center to a service center perspective. So with that very brief summary, um, Beth, oh, well, it's, it's gone to its own little thing, okay. Um, let me open the floor for uh, questions uh, and see what kinds of uh, comments or questions you have um, based on what our speakers have said to us. The microphones are uh, in the centers of the room and on either end. I'm Ron Larson uh, from the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, and I wanted to reflect a little bit on, on Jorge's comments in particular. Uh, Jorge, I always enjoy the perspective you bring on issues like demographics, and you do extremely well. But what most people may not know is that Jorge and I have a competition each year around trying to hire 
diverse faculty in our respective schools. Mm -hmm. and, and the bad news is he usually wins. Uh, and, and, and I think this is actually a real, real serious problem. Not that he wins, uh, but, but that the pool is so hugely small. Uh, there's, there's a couple, typically African-American and Latino PhDs that graduate in our field each year, and we're all kind of doing a, a food fight to, to, to try to, to, try to, get, to get them to our campuses. Uh, meanwhile, my, my provost uh, continues to remind me that I need to recruit more diverse faculty and more diverse students, and I say I would love to do that. Uh, but I think we need some more creative approaches than to just identify the problem, and so I'd like to kind of get some, some thinking about that. Uh, when I was walking in here uh, this afternoon, I, I uh, uh, happened to come in at the same time that Don Waters from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation was coming in. And, and Don's been a very s a strong supporter of the information school's efforts to expand diversity. So one thing we're trying to do, in fact, before I get into that, I'm going to take a minute to go back. When I look at our own school's history of success in recruiting diverse faculty and students, many of you will recall a gentleman by the name of E.J. Josie, who was on our faculty at Pittsburgh many years ago. He was a phenomenal person at bringing in African-American students into our program because he was out there passionately recruiting them. We thought this was kind of a natural state of affairs until he retired. And then our, our, our student body immediately went white again. It really needs some kind of an aggressive, proactive effort. So uh, thanks to Don Waters, he has been sponsoring among the information schools now a, a, process, a program we call the iSchool Inclusion Institute which tries to get at this problem from a very long-term perspective. We try to recruit undergraduate students from Hispanic and African-American populations to a year-long process of mentorship and summer institutes uh, with the idea of trying to ultimately show them that they can succeed in graduate school and they can become faculty themselves and they can draw students into this uh, effort as well. But as Don has mentioned, and as his colleagues at, at the Mellon Foundation have mentioned, you know, that's a program that maybe has a 10-year possibility of modest success. And it seems to me we need a whole lot more programs like that, and perhaps other ones that we haven't thought about that are more creative. So, Jorge, you're great with numbers. You're great at bringing, bringing uh, the student or the, the faculty that I would love to bring to Pittsburgh to Rutgers. Uh, and I would like to hear some conversation, some of your thoughts about other things we might be able to do to address the dramatic demographic issues that we're all going to be confronting. The best competitors, I think, are worthy competitors. Ron is a very worthy competitor. Um, there are two things that, that we bump up against um, in a faculty that genuinely has goodwill and a desire to bring in more diverse colleagues. And that is, faculty have a tendency to want to hire people in a very narrow sense. They're, they're looking for people to do certain things. And when they do that, they shrink the pool. And when you shrink the pool, the likelihood of finding minorities in it becomes even smaller. So they inadvertently tend to shrink the the pool of considered applicants, and that makes the pool of minorities um, even even smaller. So one solution to that is is recruit broadly. Convince your faculty, convince your colleagues that even if they don't fit a particular spot, that having them on the faculty is still beneficial, and, and recruit broadly. And keep in mind that these same faculty and colleagues are people who will tell you that the more mixed up our thinking group is, the better our ideas are. So it isn't as if they don't understand the value of diversity. Um, it's that they tend to look uh, quite narrowly when they look. The second thing that happens is the, the candidate is identified, you start negotiating to hire faculty, get wind of it, and they come in and say, how can you pay that person that much money? Because we're not making that much money. And they are fundamentally mixing up qualifications with the nature of special labor, labor pools and special labor negotiations. When you're looking for somebody, regardless of who they are, and they have something you want, you've automatically taken them out of the general labor pool and put them into a special labor negotiation. And in that one, the rules are different. So because you really want to bring that person in. So when you really want to bring that person in, our experience is you do what's necessary to, 
to bring that person in and you try to work with, uh, with faculty around it. Uh, there was a time, since I've been around for a while, that when that happened, faculty would take it out on the candidate uh, and they would do things that were appalling uh, to the candidate. I don't think we're there at, at this point in our, in our history, but we're still where um, faculty don't necessarily understand why you're going so aggressively after somebody. And, you know, that's got to be, got to be explained. You know, we want to change our, our workforce. We got to do it. Um, so part of it, the other part is what Ron said is absolutely true. Provost comes down and says, uh, I see you had a hiring, uh, you hired some people this year and you didn't bring in any, any minorities. What's the matter? You know, and you've got to explain. And when you explain that you tried or whatever, he says, well, if you don't do any next year, maybe you won't get to hire so many people. Because I've got other people over here who do want to hire. And, I, and I've only got a limited number of lines. So performance is also connected, and that's also hard to communicate to faculty. You know, most faculty's performance concerns are about themselves, not about the dean. And deans come and go, as far as they're concerned. So those are issues I think we need to be um, more alert to. And, you know, as aggressive as we are, maybe we need to be more aggressive. Um, Kathleen, did you have a comment? Yeah, I would just like to say that um, in terms of our uh, data, um, as I, I mentioned, uh, we found that positive exposure to uh, libraries and librarians was the best predictor of librarianship as a career choice. So I would like to suggest that um, we really need to ally with our school and public library colleagues and ensure that they are talking um, to students from, you know, from diverse populations and encouraging them um, as, as well as it being, you know, something that, that all of us can think about doing. But, you know, getting people, you know, into that pipeline is really key and positive experience is going to keep them there. Um, Jay. Jay Schaefer, uh, UMass Amherst. Kathleen, I was interested in your discussion about paraprofessionals taking on more professional duties. And I think that was true at a time, but now, it, at least in our institution, we have more downsizing of paraprofessional and clerical positions and a greater need for new professional positions, librarians and other kinds of professionals, um, to do new kinds of 21st century library work. And so I see the trend as being the, the paraprofessional and clerical side going down and the professional side growing. I don't know if that's just us or a trend. Yeah, I, I think that there is something that's, that's happening there, and I agree with that. I, I also, um, you know, you always wish when you have a data set that you could go back and probe further and, you know, ask the questions a little bit better. Um, I suspect myself that um, what was primarily happening was around segmentation of responsibilities. So, you know, if you're looking at a function, whatever it is, acquisitions perhaps, um, you know, the paraprofessional staff are, are taking on more higher level responsibilities, but in the end there is still that portion of responsibilities that professional staff um, need to perform. So I think that that's what was happening rather than just kind of this holus bolus, you know, role, role shift. Um, and and I, do, I, I do agree with you. I think that um, because of some of the changes in post-secondary education, uh, Jorge talked about you know, big science and big data and all of those other things, that we, that we really are looking at um, you know, very different professional positions that we, than we've had in the past. So I think that that, that, that is uh, more of an emphasis now. Um, and yes, yeah, something that, that deserves further exploration. I agree. Ruth Jackson from the University of California, Riverside. Um, in terms of recruiting the best and the brightest into the field, there hasn't been very much mention of the salary challenge in the data that you collected. Uh, for a book chapter that I was writing uh, last year, I surveyed um, members of the um, Black Caucus of the American Library Association, and the salary challenge was one factor that was listed. I think it was the second highest factor uh, in terms of why African Americans are not coming into the field 
the way they did at one time. They have other opportunities and when they're looking at salaries, they'd like to go into a field that pays more when you have the master's degree. And I really think that, <clears throat> I'm not quite sure what the solution is, but I do know that historically, in the early stages of our field, the major professional associations did do salary surveys to make comparisons of other disciplines that required the same level of education as librarians. And it may be time to do that again. And I know we've been working on salaries, but just looking across the board, uh, we do pay fairly low for someone with a master's degree when you compare that degree with some other areas like social work, I'll, I'll just mention one. And at that time, a survey was also done of librarians in, in terms of the best and the brightest. And at that time, our IQs, the typical IQ of a librarian was equal to that of an engineer. You know, I don't know if that still exists, but I just think we need to do more work as a field to, to look at the issues uh, preventing minorities from coming in. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Any response? Yeah, a couple, a couple of thoughts on that. I'm glad you brought it up for one thing. Um, we've, uh, when I talked to our um, vice president for uh, admissions, who is very concerned about uh, African Americans, especially, uh, he's got a lot of a lot of experience with that, but also other minority groups entering college. He mentions a couple of things, and that is that undergraduates make decisions on the basis not of data but urban myth. Right? They tend to choose a college on the basis of whose sweatshirt they like the best. They tend to choose a major on the basis of what their friends tell them is either easy or hard or fun or whatever the variable that they are they are choosing. Um, and they tend to recognize certain majors above others when those majors produce public intellectuals. So when they, you know, go on TV or their parents are watching a program, somebody comes on and says, I got an engineering degree at such and such a university. People think, 18 year olds think they know who engineers are, they think they know who scientists are, they think they know who business people are, they're not so sure about everybody else. On top of that, in, in regards to minority access to undergraduate education, a large number of at least those that we experience are the first in their family to go to college. When you're the first in your family to go to college, college isn't a place where you come and find yourself. Mm -hmm. College is a place where your parents are putting a lot of expectations on you, and one of them is you better goddamn well make more money than I put into sending you to college, mm -hmm. right? That already shifts the playing field. It shifts the playing field in, in the direction of certain majors that kids push themselves into later when they find they're not well suited for it, they're not happy in it, they make a change. And that change can be a life crisis because their family may not necessarily have been tracking it and being very sympathetic. So there is a tendency for a lot of minority kids to gravitate to majors that they either that they and their parents understand or think they understand or they think they understand the income. Um, drawn in and where they think they're going to be able to have a, a long lifetime in terms of, of making making money. Um, now, so, so one lesson I think for us is, is we need public intellectuals out there who say, I'm a librarian, I do need stuff, and these are some things to learn about it. Um, and not just showing up on PBS, no, no disrespect intended, but showing up on PBS to tell you what books to read this summer. You know, that's important. But it's also important to show up and recognize all the different things we do and project members of the profession as public intellectuals who will speak about that in public. So who's talking about big data? Computer scientists are talking about big data. Well, they shouldn't be the only ones talking about big data. They're not the only ones engaged in dealing with big data. We're engaged in dealing with big data, and we ought to be out there. So we need to produce these public intellectuals and, uh, and support them. And when we do, more kids coming in will say, oh yeah, I could be that, uh, be, be that as well. The part that you said about IQs, absolutely true. There's no data that shows that better IQs do this, lower IQs do that. Once they're in college, the distributions are just different. That's mm -hmm. all. People just spread themselves out in all, uh, all kinds of different ways. What we do see, though, is that middle class kids experience university life much differently from working class kids. Mm -hmm. 
the, the, the risk of failure is far, far higher for working class kids. The expectation of success is far, far higher for, uh, for working class kids. So if those are the populations we're drawing from, uh, it would be good to have counseling available, to have librarians talking to kids about that, to talk the language they're talking and engage the subjects that they're engaging in the way they perceive them. Yeah, I would just like to agree with that. Um, we, we are never going to be able to compete in national labor markets on the basis of salary. That's, I just don't think I'm going to be something that we're ever going to see. But, um, you know, just going back to something I said previously, um, our job satisfaction levels are very, very high in this profession. And that's the word that we need to get out, that this is a great profession. You can have a great career. You can do all of those exciting things that Horia was talking about. So, I mean, I think that's our attractant right there. Uh, Brian. Uh, Brian Chocolander from UC San Diego. A question for Kathleen. Um, I, I'm, maybe I'm the only one in the room. Maybe I'm not. I, I was interested that you didn't comment on this. To have been struck by what seems to me like a fairly obvious correlation between um, the relative longevity of those in the profession and their relatively high degree of satisfaction. Doesn't that sort of seem like a no-brainer? <laughs> yeah, I guess, um, you know, I guess it does. Um, as I said, when we looked at the data, we um, always segmented it by, you know, stage of library career. And certainly uh, we found those same high levels of satisfaction at all levels. So um, I would say that, um, yeah, you know, it is a no-brainer, but it's, it's something that is, um, uh, that is characteristic of, of all levels of uh, number of years in the profession. So let me just ask a corollary then. So did you do any analysis to see whether the converse is also true? In other words, in professions where there's a relatively lower degree of job satisfaction, is there more churn? Yeah, no, we didn't. But that would be an interesting, you know, an interesting comparator for sure. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Bridget Burke, Boston College again. Um, I do special collections, so I was really struck by um, where his third point about continuing to build unique resources in the humanities, and I think where you're going with that is um, a lot of collecting in special collections is about making connections with communities. So I'll say again, I'm Bridget Burke. I'm from Boston College. I do okay with, you know, the, the ladies' ancient order of Hibernians. We're, we're really good on the Irish American community. Not so good on the, say, um, Hmong community, which is actually the largest you know, growing population of Catholics in Boston. So I think you know, it has a real implication for collections if we do not recruit diversity in special collections because then we do not reflect in our collections that diverse American experience. And I think RBMS has been really, really active um, with its diversity group in, in trying to push that issue forward. So it, it's another bullet point under, under collections. Well, absolutely. I mean, uh, special collections, unique collections establish value in a number of ways. The way we think of them establishing value is they establish value to our colleagues who are, who are very interested in these and come and, and study them. But they also, as you said, establish value to the larger community beyond that we need to support us. Uh, so the fact that we go out, for example, and collect um, the literary works of, of regional authors and bring them in and establish a collection of, around that is also a way of saying thank you, which universities don't do a very good job of, saying thank you to communities that are out there and reminding them that we have something that also, uh, also connects with them. University administrators rarely look at their university library as an ambassador beyond because they tend to see it as providing service within. Mm -hmm. But the creation of unique um, collections as we go forward in an era of diminishing resources is one, I think, very visible and important way of saying thank you and establishing value to constituents. Great. And with that, um, join me in, oh, I'm sorry, did you have a question? Yeah. Go ahead. We got time for one more. Yeah. I'm, glad I'm sorry, I didn't turn fast enough. No problem. Jim Mahalko from OCLC Research. Uh, one of the things I was hoping you'd reflect on is 
Both of you mentioned the, the, the significant shift in the, in the nature and form of library work, of information professional work, within, within the academy particularly. Most of the conversation I've heard from folks here about their hiring uh, is there, there, it's the rarity to find them hiring uh, a traditional uh, library slash information school graduate. Uh, they're, they're, they're hiring domain professionals. Uh, they're socializing them in some sometimes very um, structured ways and other times leaving it to the wisdom of their colleagues to, you know, to bring them in. It, it just strikes me that, that doesn't that change the, the nature of the, of the pipeline crisis? Don't we have to re-examine that based on the, the form of professional, the, the type of skills and competencies that we want? Um, and, and I'm sure you think about this within the context of, uh, of the school, uh, but I would also think you're, you, you, you've encountered this as you've restructured the work at Alberta. I'd just be interested in, in your thoughts. Yeah, um, when we were um, engaged in, in our research, we were just beginning to see some of that. And um, we did have some numbers um, in, uh, we did have some data. It was, it, it was very, uh, you know, just very small indications at the time. Uh, but I do believe that, yes, that, you know, there's that whole other um, labor force, if you will, that um, we can tap into. And I think that that is, is something that we need to, we need more research about, right? And I mean, there's been some great articles um, uh, talking about the abilities that, that people can bring. Um, and, uh, you know, what does that mean for, for our organizations? Uh, great question, and, and we need to know more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a quick note on what I think of as a paradox. We get a lot of advice from, from professionals on how we should educate our students for the profession. And the, I would say the main themes of that advice are they need to learn all the basics, they need to learn to be able to do this, they need to learn to be able to do that. And we teach them to do that. And then our colleagues go out and hire people who are professionals in other fields and send them to library school after they become established. So what's the disconnect? The disconnect is that the pressure we're getting from the profession should be train leaders, train people who can connect to other professions and, and go out and do that. But we're not getting that message. We're getting the opposite message. And what we do, in terms of urban myths, our students internalize that other message very deeply. They resist anything that has to do with building beyond what's going to get them their first job. Mm -hmm. Because that's all they hear about. So the discourse has to change. You change the discourse, we'll change the students. We can't change the students if we're going against the urban myths. Excellent. And that is a wonderful way to end this panel. Yeah. So thank you. Join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you for listening. Music was provided by Josh Woodward. For more talks from this meeting, please visit www.arl.org.